Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Backer and welcome to Write Better Stories. Today I am going to talk about The Cave and the Light by Arthur Herman. And in a future video, I am going to talk about Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, which is a book that I started today that is very good, so look forward to that one. Um, but in this video in particular, I'm going to discuss Plato and Aristotle and philosophy and Christianity, and then I'm going to do a reading about how both philosophy and Christianity influenced the creation of the Sistine Chapel. And then I'm also going to offer a few criticisms of this book. Um, so overall, as the title suggests, The Cave in the Light is drawing heavily from Plato's uh, famous description of the allegory of the cave, and this is something that, at least according to this book, is the foundation of Western philosophy, and so basically the allegory says that the life that we live is basically like living in a cave where we are facing the back of the cave and we see our reality as shadows that are being projected in front of us. And so the obvious implication here is that the reality that surrounds us is an illusion. And what philosophy is for and wisdom is for is to basically ex uh, ex escape the cave in order to get to the light. And... The way that we would do this is through reason, through internal investigation, and understanding of higher ideals that we can escape this illusory nature of the world in order to get to the actual truth. And so this is something that is basically the foundation of Plato's idea of the theory of forms, which is that anything that you investigate in front of you is not the perfect version of that thing. It's an imperfect uh, version of the perfect version of it that exists in the realm of forms. So, for example, like Pringle here is not the perfect linulated parakeet. He is an imperfect representation of the perfect parakeet that exists in the realm of forms. And so in this transcendent realm of forms, it's interesting because it's kind of a mishmash of not only conceptually the perfect version of everything that these illusory versions are supposed to be imperfect representations of, but then it's also perfect versions of like goodness and the divine. And so then a lot of this book also contrasts Aristotle's version of Western philosophy, which is that the world around us should be interpreted and understood as it appears to us. He was much more into things like taxonomy and just a, uh, a much more like, I guess, empirical understanding of the way that the world works. And uh, that tension, according to Arthur Herman, is something that animates Western history and Western intellectual tradition, that you can look at Plato as like the idealist, and then Aristotle as more of the realist. And then each of them had their um, respective views on ways of organizing thought and politics and aesthetics and everything in between. And I would say, overall, Arthur Herman does a very good job of going through history in a very entertaining way to discuss the influence of these two thinkers. And so I will say that if you're looking for a book that is like extremely academic and gets into the minutia of these two thinkers' ideas, this isn't really the book for you. This is a good starting off point for further research, in my opinion. And that's actually what drew me to it in the first place, is that um, I, if, or if you've seen any of the videos on this channel before, you know that I'm really interested in postmodern literature and postmodern philosophy, but I have a ton of gaps in my understanding of history and intellectual history before the 20th century, and to be honest, even in the 20th century. Um, so this is not like a graduate level textbook or anything like that. They're not going to be teaching this in schools, but for a like consumer grade kind of like middle brow philosophy book, this is, I think, an awesome book. And it really helped me fill in a lot of the gaps of my understanding and gave me a ton of ideas for future research. Um, so I think where the book shines the most is just in giving a little bit more meat 
to some of the thinkers that you've probably heard of before, but then also introducing thinkers that you might not have heard of before. So, for example, the coolest guy that I'd never heard of before that they talked about in this book was Plotinus, and he was considered the father of Neoplatonism. And so that idea of the cave and the light and the theory of forms, he fleshed that out a little bit by introducing this hierarchy, that it wasn't just that the world that's around us is illusory and it is this imperfect representation of something higher. He introduced this idea as almost that there was these like steps, that it's like God and goodness and everything there is on the highest rung, and then as you go down, you take steps away from that until you basically get to dirt. And um, that was interesting to me specifically in the way that he discussed that being related to Christianity, because I was actually raised a Catholic, and I went to Catholic elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. And I had a pretty thorough Catholic upbringing and education, and I had never heard of any of the like philosophical import of Christianity. So, for example, like when um, Catholicism had taught me that Jesus was the Son of God, um, I just sort of took that to be as some sort of like validation of his authority, is that like not only was he a important guy, but he is like from God, so you better listen to what he says. So what's cool about this book is that he explained how they used Platonic philosophy and Neoplatonism in order to validate and spread Christianity at the time that when it was first getting started. So it wasn't just that Jesus was the Son of God, but just like the theory of forms tells us that like an earthly iteration of something is that imperfect version of the perfect version of it that might exist in a realm that transcends us, Jesus was the iteration of that higher form from the realm that transcends us. And so that just like really filled in the gaps for me in a lot of ways. And I would say to this day, I'm not super into Christianity or anything like that. So if you don't love Christianity, don't let that turn you off this book because I think he does a really good job of like not trying to convince you to be a Christian, but basically just telling you that there was like an intellectual history that helped Christianity spread and then gave a lot of Western intellectual tradition its backbone. Um, so then beyond that, I thought it was interesting how then Michelangelo ended up taking some of those ideas and then using it to create the Sistine Chapel ceiling, because this is like another one of those kind of like greatest hits of Western history. Everyone's heard of the Sistine Chapel, and when I had seen pictures of it before reading this book, it just, I'm not sure it was like as evocative or potent for interpretation for me to look into it much further. Other than, like, I think there's, oh, a piece of lore that, like, Michelangelo put the Pope at the time, like, in hell. Like, there's fun things about it in that regard. Um, but beyond that, I just, like, wasn't too interested in hearing about it. But then the way that Arthur Miller writes about it in The Cave in the Light is really interesting because he just breaks down that, like, not only was this something that was supposed to be this uh, pro-Christian sentiment, but it ended up having like some philosophical weight behind it too. And so I think that like Plotinus's Neoplatonism was very clearly manifest in the ideas behind the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And so I'm just going to point out a few moments from the book if Pringle stops gnawing on my hands for a moment. And I'll show how Pla or uh, Plotinus's ideas, Jesus Pringle, relax, about how his ideas ended up showing up on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So give me just one moment. Okay. I've got feathers all over me. Pringle is in a mood right now. Okay, so on page 137 of The Cave in the Light, Arthur Miller writes that Plotinus was also the most relentlessly anti-materialist thinker in history. Pringle, that hurts. <laughs> Pringle, get off, come on. Okay, I'm so sorry about him. Okay, so Plotinus was the most, an or was the most relentlessly anti-materialist thinker in history. He taught his disciples that everything we see or imagine to be real is actually only a series of faded images of a higher realm of pure ideas and pure spirit, intelligible only to the soul. 
According to his student Porphyry of Tyre, he was even sorry that his soul had to live inside a physical body. And so um, this is pretty clearly related to Plato's theory of forms, which is a very idealist way of looking at the world. So again, it's that everything that we see in front of us as reality is an illusion and an imperfect representation of this higher realm of transcendent forms. And so Plotinus took that to the nth degree, saying that even his body was somehow like a lie and it uh, distracted from the soul. And so this was many decades and maybe even centuries. I don't know or care for now. Pringle. You can tell that Pringle is not too into Plotinus, so we'll discuss that later. Um, okay, so in a couple chapters later on page 298 is when they talk about the uh, Sistine Chapel ceiling, and I'll read from there. The theme is the struggle of the human soul to escape its physical limitations of the body in order to realize its true freedom. The panels depict the central episodes from Genesis in a dynamic but abruptly edited sequence like a Stanley Kubrick movie, starting with creation and God's separation of light from darkness, a visualization of spiritual energy at its most divine and abstract. However, Michelangelo has arranged the sequence in reverse order. When we enter the chapel and look up at each panel, what we actually see is a chronicle of the soul's ascent from the realm of matter to that of pure spirit. So, I think that the influence of both Plato and Plotinus is pretty apparent there. I was going to read a little bit more, but uh, Pringle is freaking out on me right now. Um, and so now here, I just want to make sure that I don't run out of time here. Okay, so I've got about three minutes left. I'll, I'll do it in a shorter time than that. Basically, overall, I really enjoyed this book because, like I said, it filled in some of the gaps in my thinking and understanding of history and intellectual tradition. But, um, it doesn't go too deep, and so it also gave me just a lot of ideas of different names that I wanted to study more of, like Plotinus and this guy named Origen, and uh, Giovanni Pico de Mirandola, I thought was interesting because he talked about how every single study and branch of wisdom was all part of one totality, and how like each of the different religions were true in their own way, and I thought that was pretty forward-thinking for a guy that was writing in the Renaissance, and... Uh, now we'll get on to the criticisms. Um, I am a little suspicious in reading this book that it was written in order to support the idea that there is this like Western canon that should be respected. Because in the intro, he talks about how a lot of these thinkers get dismissed just as being like white males. And so even though the book is good and, and does a good summary of the Western tradition of intellectual history... Um, it does seem like kind of behind the scenes he's trying to demonstrate that this isn't something that should be brushed off or uh, or taken on short shrift or anything like that. Um, because you'll frequently see people, you know, kind of want to throw these ideas out. Or like I saw on Twitter that somebody called like Aristotle a bro, which I thought was kind of funny. And... Uh, so yeah, like I think that's definitely the perspective that Arthur Herman is writing from. And then also, in one of the last chapters of the book, he talks about how um, one of the examples of like cultural decline was like gangster rap. And that was like kind of cringy just for him to, one, call it gangster rap for a book that was released so recently. And then also to look at that as this sign of like decadence or something like that. And so I don't think that really undermines the entire book, but it is helpful to know that it's like, that seems to be that the perspective that Arthur Herman is writing from. He also makes his uh, contempt for Karl Marx pretty well known. And so I think that some of the better chapters are a lot of the like earlier centuries in intellectual history because they're not as like fresh or fraught uh, for like modern reference. Whereas like once he gets into the 20th century, I could see people being a little bit more hesitant to get on board with some of the things that he's saying. But overall, it's a very good book. Um, again, it shouldn't be the end-all be-all, but it's a great jumping off point for future reading. And um, yeah, I, I think that will teach you to write better stories or to at least give you some ideas for some other things to research. So have a good day. Goodbye.